Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. Today we continue our series of conversations on the history of Palestine. Today we're going to talk specifically about the history of Palestinian resistance. My guest for this is Ilan Pape. Ilan Pape is a professor of history and director of the European Center for Palestine Studies at the University of Exeter in the United Kingdom. And he is also the author of the book, A History of Modern Palestine. He joins us from Palestine. Ilan Pape, it's my good pleasure to welcome you to this program. Thank you for taking the time. It's a great pleasure to be on your program, Mitch. Thank you for having me. I heard the speech that you gave in Berkeley uh, just this past October, and something that really struck me, uh, of many things that you said that really struck me, but, but I think one thing that really hit me was that you said, despite things that happen that may be regrettable, tragic, you know, quarrel, you know, problematic, um, that, that, that even tugs at our, our at, at, at what we think is acceptable. It's still always important to see Palestine as an anti-colonial movement. What, what, how, tell me about that. Tell me Palestine as an anti-colonial movement. Do you, do you see this connected to the history of the global anti-colonial movements of the 20th century? Yes, uh, I think it is connected, but it's it's very hard to uh, convince a lot of people who uh, are even experts on anti-colonial movements or are interested in decolonization, either as uh, pundits or scholars, or just, you know, ordinary people who find these issues interesting, it's very difficult to convince them that uh, both the Zionist movement, uh, 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 that, that the Zionist movement, first of all, should be defined as a colonialist or a settler colonial movement, and therefore the Palestinian resistance to it should be framed as, as anti-colonialists. Um, uh, so for me, it's, it's quite obvious uh, in any way I, I look at it historically, but not only historically, if I if I use what I think are conventional and acceptable definition of anti-colonialist uh, movement, uh, either through, you know, academic frameworks or in the public mind, uh, I think Palestine, the Palestinian struggle fits very well into these categories. But of course, when you define something as anti, uh, you have to be clear that what they are against is indeed colonialism. And, and I think that's where it starts. You know, not so much is uh, do we accept that uh, the Palestinian struggle is anti-colonialist. First of all, we have to accept that Zionism is a form of colonialism. I think most scholars like to fine-tune, you know, the definition and say it's settler colonialism, which is a, is a, is a particular version of, of colonialism. So, so do do you do you see Israel as settler colonialist? Yes, I, I think first of all, I see the Zionist movement that established Israel as a settler colonialist movement. I think it's not different in many ways uh, from the movement of Europeans who colonized North America. Uh, uh, they have a lot of in common. Uh, the, the Jews who came to Palestine and the Christians mainly who came to 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 America at least as the first waves of settlers. They were both refugees from Europe. They were both persecuted in Europe for religious and cultural reasons. And they, both these movements wanted to recreate Europe in a different place, the Europe that didn't want them, but they still wanted to be part of Europe. And uh, they chose, and that's another common feature, they chose a place where someone else already lived. And uh, they acted or reacted to the presence of another people in their newly coveted uh, home and homeland uh, in the same way, believing that they need to remove the indigenous native people if they want to succeed in recreating a new uh, Europe uh, instead of the Europe that didn't want them. So, so I think there's a lot of similarities that justify looking first of all at the Zionist movement as settler colonialism. But what is so unique about uh, Israel, and I think that's where it differs in, in, in some ways from the United States or Canada that were 
built as settler colonial projects like Israel was, that uh, it's uh, uh, in failure in many ways to complete the settler colonialist project of the, as the late uh, Patrick Wolf would call it, the project of the elimination of the native, as they were unable to complete the elimination of the native on the day that the new state was born, uh, they are still at it. And because they are still at it, the state's institutions, the discourse of the politicians, uh, the educational system, the, the actions on the ground, they all indicate that Israel still behaves as a settler colonial project when it comes to the Palestinians. I wanted to focus specifically on the history of then an anti-colonial Palestinian movement. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, and the reason I referenced 20th century for, for, is for many reasons. One, this is a movement that actually is happening in the 20th century as well. This is something that's mm -hmm. going on for a very long time uh, in Palestine that would, that would parallel in time these other movements that you had, the Pan-Arab movement, the, uh, the the movements in Africa, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Yes, I, I think that um, one particular uh, feature of that struggle that sometimes escape uh, those who are interested in the topic is the fact that the anti-colonialist movement in the Arab world as a whole uh, went on two parallel tracks, so to speak. Uh, it began with an idea, uh, apart from few countries such as Algeria, but basically, especially in the Eastern Mediterranean, what the Arabs call the Mashra, where Palestine is located geographically in the Eastern part of the Mediterranean, uh, of the Middle East uh, as well. Um, in that part, uh, uh, the, initially the idea of decolonization uh, was to try and replace the European powers that came after the Ottoman rules, uh, uh, rule uh, with a united Arab national identity, even a republic. Maybe some of them who were more religious were thinking about the caliphate. Uh, others may have thought about the kingdom rather than a republic. But the idea was that uh, there is a lot of common commonalities between the, the people who speak Arabic and have an Arabic heritage and history and belong to the Islamic civilization uh, uh, to try and replace the colonial, uh, the particular colonization that occurred uh, in the Arab world, uh, especially in the eastern part of the Middle East after the Second, uh, First World War, with a united Arab uh, uh, presence. However, the colonialist powers were uh, strong enough to prevent that kind of collective Arab identity. In fact, one could call it even an attempt to create the United States of the Arab world. You know, so they, they were very, very much inspired by the American uh, model. Uh, but that didn't work because Britain and France in particular did not want a united Arab national entity. And, and therefore, the, the parallel track began to, to develop, which is nationalities of Arab states according to the states that most of them were artificially created by the colonial powers at the end of the First World War. But even within these relatively artificial creation, the struggle was against British and, uh, and French uh, dominance. So it was it was an anti-colonial struggle, maybe not the same as we are familiar with in Africa or Southeast Asia or, or Latin America, but it was it was definitely uh, uh, motivated by the wish for independence and self-determination. The Palestinian case in it uh, has very unique features. On the one hand, it's it's part of this idea, or if you want, it's part of this ambiguity of do we. Are we fighting for the liberation of the whole of the Arab world as one united new free uh, country? Uh, some would say, well, at least let's have a free, what they call greater Syria, that is a huge country. Uh, and that includes uh, Syria of today, Jordan of today, Lebanon, Palestine and Israel. Uh, uh, some of them said, OK, let's accept the new division to, to countries and states and fight for liberation and freedom of Palestine. What was so unique for them, which the 
Egyptian, Jordanian, Lebanese, Syrian, and Iraqi liberation movement did not have to face was Zionism. Because the, you could always hope, and rightly so, that a, col a classical colonialist empire, be it France or, or Britain, has uh, its, col its colonialist uh, uh, communities have somewhere to go back to. And uh, it was very clear that historically these huge empires, especially after the Second World War, would disintegrate. And, and, and decolonization, at least of the land, was, was a very feasible and doable project. But what do you do when the colonialist uh, empire works alongside a settler colonial movement that does not want, first of all, states that it, its people have nowhere to go to, one thing, and secondly, uh, is determined to uh, uh, be engaged in a project of displacement and replacement of the native population. And, and, and then the anti-colonialist struggle in the case of Palestine that begins probably around 1920, probably around 1920, is directed both against the Brit, in, in a classical way, against the British Empire, like the rest of the Arab uh, national movements, namely, we want Britain to end its presence and allow us to have an independent Arab state or, or United Arab League, it doesn't matter. But also the, the, the Palestinian leaders and activists suddenly realize that Britain is not their problem. Britain would leave, they understand it, especially after the Second World War. The problem is existential, that they are facing a movement that does not want to colonize them or uh, exploit them, but wants to destroy them. And that changes the nature, the orientation, the vision of the Palestinian liberation movement. And if I have to give kind of a chronological moment for that transformation, where it's very clear that you shift from Britain to Zionism, it's more or less after uh, 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 1939, after uh, when the Second World War begins, and slowly Palestinians understand that this settler colonial project is seen by Europe and especially after 45, seen by Europe as the best solution for Europe's Jewish problem. So they're not only facing Zionism, they're not only facing Britain, they're facing a Europe that is determined to allow their destruction in order to compensate the Jews for the Holocaust and centuries of, of anti-Semitism. And the United States, a little bit later, will join in into this powerful coalition that maintained the settler colonial project of Zionism and later of Israel. Let, let me come back to the 1920s. Tell me about the uprising or resistance that, that's happening in, in the 20s. I think there's an important 1929 uprising slash riot. And these are these are farmers or, or and peasants, aren't they? Well, not only. Most of them are. But it depends. Uh, it begins in, in two uh, uh, important attempts to use mainly demonstrations and petitions in 1920 and 1921, uh, uh, these demonstrations deteriorate to clashes, especially in 1921, uh, with Jewish demonstrators and, and the army. Uh, in 1920 as well, they are meeting the more uh, extreme uh, uh, groups of the, of the Zionist movement led by Jabotinsky in the old city. These are small events, relatively, 1920-21. But if you read uh, the, uh, the speeches, uh, and there was already important uh, newspapers uh, around, you can see that this cause is anti-colonialist and national, already 1920-21. At that moment, it's less the rural areas. In 2021, it's much more the urban educated elite that is leading uh, the way, together with you know more traditional old families that were the social and political elite of Palestine uh, uh, during the Ottoman rule. In, in 1929, you're right, the focus of the anti-colonial struggle moves to the countryside. And the reason it moves to the countryside is that already three years before 1929, in 1926, was the first time that the Zionist movement 
purchase a sizable number of plots of lands from absentee landlords, for people who owned these lands but were not Palestinians, they lived in Beirut. And with the help of the British, they not only purchased the land, they also evict the villages that are on the land. So it's the first time that you have an ethnic cleansing operation under British law in the man mandate of few thousands Palestinians. And uh, this is not only affecting the Palestinians who were evicted and had to go to, to the cities as, uh, you know, as, as, as unemployed uh, uh, workers also without proper uh, places to live in. It also created a, 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 a ripple effect on other Palestinian villages uh, that began to lose their ability to live off the land. And they went by 28, 29, they went to the towns such as Haifa and Jaffa. And we begin to see a new phenomenon in Palestine, which was never there before, which were kind of slums. Uh, that were created in a belt around uh, the uh, around the city or around the town. In Arabic, they used to call them the Hat neighborhoods, Harat uh, al uh, Tink, and 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 uh, th these were people who were looking for for work if they could find it, and also had to live in these dismal conditions because there was no uh, space for 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 building new new homes for most of them. From there, from there. In 1929 came the first wave of anti-colonialist uh, um, attempt to mainly to show by force the outrage of the Palestinian people uh, and to try to persuade the British government to show them the consequences of the idea that Palestine should be a Jewish state when in 1929 the Jews were still less than 30 percent of the of the population and in a way there was some success, a very temporary success. In 1930, Britain published a white paper that uh, uh, retracted from the Balfour Declaration and began to attend to the Palestinian aspirations under the pressure of the Zionist lobby. That particular white paper was shelved and, and forgotten. But, but it was uh, seen by the Palestinians in 29, in 29, 2030, gave them hope maybe they have the power through an anti-colonialist struggle uh, uh, to change, to reorientate the unconditional support Britain gave to the idea of the colonization and Judaization of uh, Palestine. This is Letters in Politics, and we are in conversation with Ilan Pape, Professor of History and Director of the European Center for Palestine Studies at the University of Exeter in the United Kingdom. He's the author of many books, including A History of Modern Palestine. Let me next move to, to 1936. There, there's a major revolt. And, and we've been doing a number of conversations about the history of Palestine, but this has been a deep learning curve for me. So anything I, I confuse, you will let me know. But in 1936, there, there's a major revolt that I, I believe began as a general strike. A general strike occurred in Palestine? Yes. Yes, it did. Uh, it, 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 you have to go a little bit uh, earlier to, to 1930, 1934, uh, kind of two years before the, that general strike. Uh, uh, the Palestinians already have an established leadership through so something which is called the Palestinian Arab Congresses. These are annual con congresses that meet once a year and represent the variety of political parties and opinions among the uh, educated uh, and may, mainly urban uh, uh, Palestinian uh, society, but also have a lot of following and branches, I even would say, in many Palestinian villages. Uh, so, so there is a kind of a, a, an established, I would say even an institutionalized a body. Eventually, it's called the Arab Higher Committee, which in 1934 becomes the official kind of spokesperson uh, for the Palestinians and its representative vis-a-vis -vis the British authorities in, in the attempts to reconcile the idea of the colonization, of the Judaization of Palestine with the aspiration for independence of the Palestinians. And um, uh, there, because of the rise of Nazism and fascism 
in Europe already in 33-34, which added uh, a, a large number of Im- Jewish immigrants to the already uh, to the to the more veteran Jewish community in Palestine, because the numbers increased quite dramatically. The number of Jews, Im- Jewish immigrants, if you want Jewish settlers, the number of Jewish settlers increased uh, in those years, 1933 to 1936. And um, the sense among the Palestinian leadership was that this is now an open gate and that they will be drowned by the settlers, let alone uh, uh, the fact that even a small number of settlers violated the promise uh, of the uh, international community for a free Palestine. But now it was a really demographic issue that they were coming in in, in large numbers. And um, if you look at the Palestinian press, and as I said, the press was very, uh, was already there and, and there were a lot of newspapers, but if you look at the Palestinian newspapers between 1934 to 1936, they are full of warnings in op-eds, or well, today we will call it op-eds, of Palestinian thinkers who say, this is going to end very badly for us. Uh, we won't be able to stop it. Britain would support it, and we may lose our homeland. They're, they are really beginning to understand the potential de- existential danger that a Jewish settlement, extended Jewish settlement in Palestine, uh, uh, constitutes uh, for them. And uh, when there is no willingness on the part of Britain to change the policy, it brings about the idea of, first of all, a huge strike, which the British uh, uh, repress very, very brutally. And that leads to uh, the idea to use other means in order uh, uh, to push for the Palestinian uh, uh, struggle. I would have to add to this the in- interesting and important role of uh, Sheikh Ez Adin al Qassam, uh, a Syrian preacher uh, who first participated in the mid 1920s in the f- Syrian anti-colonialist struggle against the French uh, and was about to be sentenced to death, uh, but managed to uh, escape from Syria and settle in Haifa. And between his arrival in the late 1920s and until he was killed by the British army in 1935, Ezzedina Kassam added to this uh, national liberation idea First of all, a a, a more religious content that added more zeal and commitment, but also connected it to the anti-colonialist struggle in Syria and in Lebanon, in other parts of the Arab world, and led the way by saying, you know, you cannot only write in newspapers, you cannot only send petitions, you cannot only go on demonstrations, you need to learn from other anti-colonialist movements. There needs to be a guerrilla warfare. So he, he's in many ways the father of the Palestinian guerrilla warfare against both the British army and the, and the Jewish settlers. And he inspired, uh, you know, very uh, uh, brave uh, young Palestinians like Abdel Qadr al-Husseini, uh, 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 that is, sons of, of notable families in the cities, to join him or to create their own guerrilla uh, movements that were the backbone of the fight against the British between 1936 to 1939, which forced Britain to bring the RAF, uh, their Royal Air Force, and to use a repertoire of ruthless and brutal uh, measures of uh, 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 kind of against against this kind of rebellion. Uh, In brackets, we can say that the Israelis uh, learned from these uh, uh, measures that the British uh, uh, used uh, against the Palestinians in 36 to 39 in all, uh, and, and renewed them when they occupied the, the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. I will just end by saying that the British response was so powerful in terms of the number of soldiers that they used, the means that they used, that they really uh, um, succeeded in affecting the Palestinian political and military leadership and wounded it and uh, undermined it 
to such an extent that when the Nakba, the catastrophe came in 1948, one of the reasons, by no means the only one, but one of the reasons of the Palestinians' inability to withstand the catastrophe was the absence of those killed, wounded, uh, uh, and destroyed by the British counterinsurgency actions in between 36 to 39. That, 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 that's important. Yeah, important to, to, to realize. Uh, we're giving an abbreviated, a big history in a short period of time here. But but speaking of the, uh, the Nakba, uh, Israelis, when the Israeli state is created, is this when we get the creation of the PLO? Not yet. Not yet. In 1948, the Palestinian society was without any proper military capacity to defend itself against a very well-planned and systematic program of uh, massive ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians. Uh, the, they were saved to a certain extent. When I say saved, but this I mean that only half, only in, of course, in a very cynical way I'm saying it, only half of the Palestinian population was expelled. And not all of Palestine was occupied by the Zionist forces. As we know, the West Bank remained in Jordanian hands and the Gaza Strip in, in, in Egyptian hands. But all in all, the Palestinian, uh, the Palestinians, both in the towns and in the rural areas, were no military match for the Zionist uh, forces, which is one of the reasons that eventually, after the end of the mandate of the 15th of May, the Arab world was willing, quite reluctantly, to send troops to try and salvage Palestine and the Palestinians. And to some extent, some of its action uh, is, is a reason why Palestinians were still in Palestine in large number, why they are in Palestine in large number uh, to this very day. The PLO became, uh, it's interesting, it, it develops a bit later. First of all, you have to understand there is, I would say there's a decade between 48 and 1958 of a trauma, of a, of a collective traumatic period. It takes 10 years for those who see themselves as potential leaders of the Palestinian liberation movement, as major activists of the Palestinian liberation movement. It takes them 10 years to uh, recuperate from, from the catastrophe, uh, to, to get their acts together. <clears throat> and at the beginning, they they try to rely once more <clears throat> on new kind of what seem to be progressive Arab leaderships. So remember in the 50s, we have the beginning of the rise of progressive radical Arab regimes like uh, the, in, in Egypt, in Iraq, and some other places. So at first, those who want to reawake the Palestinian national consciousness movement and, 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 and struggle, first rely on on these Arab countries like Egypt, uh, Syria, uh, uh, and, and even even on Jordan, although Jordan did not go through a, a radical or, or a progressive transformation, but nonetheless uh, uh, allowed some sort of struggle uh, from within. But then, and, and, and the height of this pan-Arab, uh, I would say, uh, control of the Palestinian liberation struggle, uh, reaches a certain peak in 1964 when the Arab League, not the Palestinians, the Arab League, the, the pan-Arab regional organization, uh, establishes the PLO in Jerusalem in 1964. Um, but already in 1964, there were the beginning of serious organizations of Palestinian liberation groups who began to doubt the sincerity and the effectivity of struggling for the liberation of Palestine through Arab states, through pan-Arab institutions. And already in 59, one such organization, or actually officially it was established in January 64, Fatah, uh, a Palestinian liberation organization, <clears throat> is not only uh, 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 independent in thinking compared to those who were working closely with the Arab states, it also decides and succeeds, especially after the failure of the Arab states, 
to, to win the war in June 67 to take over the PLO. Uh, and in 68, the Fatah and other groups kind of extract, in, 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 it's not a bloody affair, it's a very uh, quiet and political affair, but the, 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 Palest- the independent Palestinian organizations like the Fatah in 1968 take over from the Arab League and from, if you want, from the older Palestinian generation the anti-colonialist struggle in 1968. And these people, most of them, first of all, grew in the refugee camps uh, that were created after the uh, ethnic cleansing of Palestine. What was unique about the refugee camps, that all the class differences that existed in pre-1948 Palestine disappeared. We, they were all refugees. It didn't matter whether you came from a rich family, a poor family, it all kind of disappeared, and therefore there was a sense of, of unity that wasn't there in the older generation. Um, they were also closely connected to third world liberation movements, reading them, meeting their leaders, meeting their ideologues, uh, using their expertise and experience. Uh, and uh, we see the rise of a new PLO in 68, 69 that has a certain model for liberation that did not work, one should say, but the model of liberation and the most inspirational model, there were two of them. One was the FLN, the uh, the, Alge- the successful Algerian liberation movement that kicked out the French in 1962. But more importantly, I think they were looking at Vietnam. They thought that maybe one of the Arab states would be, you know, North Vietnam, Hanoi, and that they would be the Viet Cong. Uh, But they found out that none of the Arab states was willing to be North Vietnam. And that really did not help for their struggle. Uh, But they did have this Viet Cong, if you want, sense of purpose. Uh, And they tried everything. They tried uh, uh, hijacking airplanes, fighting the Israeli army, to try to galvanize and uprisings in the occupied territories. Not much of it was successful, but what was successful was that they kept the Palestinian issue alive. Uh, and uh, that is a great achievement, although it's one of these liberation movements that did not liberate, did not liberate. Uh, and they have a relatively impressive and successful chapter of anti-colonialist struggle, I would say until 1982, when things then developed uh, differently. Staying, staying with the 1960s here for a moment, again, when I saw you speak in Berkeley, one of the things that really stood out to me is that even when atrocities occur, when things that we will morally object to occur, we must always remember and still think of the Palestinian movement as an anti-colonial movement. You mentioned hijackings. I I think late 1960s, we start to see hijackings. There's the attack in Munich at the 1972 Olympics, which killed about approximately 10 Israeli uh, athletes. When when I heard you say what you said in Berkeley, I was thinking obviously about October 7th, which I I think you were talking about. Mm -hmm. But as I'm preparing for our conversation, I look at this history, there are many other sort of type of events. Yes, definitely, and not all of it was was acceptable. Although, you know, if if you you look more profoundly, and that's there's a difference there, I think, between the seventh of October and some of these actions, the high number of casualties in some of the salvage operation that the Israeli army attempted when uh, uh, Fatah units entered the Galilee and so on. And even Munich, if you think about the um, uh, the um, German police intervention, the high number of casualties were from these failed uh, abortive salvage operations, which doesn't mean that the, the kidnappers were un- unwilling to, to kill and so on. But I think it's important to, to, to remember that. Uh, but yes, it was violent. Uh, you know, vi- violence uh, was used by all anti-colonialist uh, 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 movements. And uh, I-, I think that it's always good to remember 
that uh, uh, that kind of violence, and that is also relevant to the 7th of October, the violence that was perpetrated by the Palestinian liberation movement was a symptom of a much more serious problem. And that was the, the, the source of the violence. The source of the violence was not the Palestinian, I don't know, political culture that uh, uh, endorsed these kinds of action. There wasn't such a Palestinian culture. Or some people tried to, to, uh, to say this is an Islamic uh, culture, which is also nonsense. No, this, the source of violence was the dispossession of the Palestinians in 1948. That was the source of, 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 of violence. Palestinians were trying to return without using violence, first of all, and still were hoping that there will be some sort of a, a, a diplomatic solution, but this was not coming. So they were using violence. And, and, and some of the violence was direct clash with the Israeli army. And I think we all, and that's okay, that's our moral compass. I think we feel a bit different when a guerrilla movement attacks an army that occupies and colonizes it, and when the guerrilla movement targets civilians, of course. Uh, but, you know, the ANC, which is probably the most uh, sacred uh, member of the Panathion of anti-colonialist movement, also, also targeted civilians. You know, they, they put bombs in bars and restaurants and so on. So, so this is an ugly side of it, but this is part of, of the warfare that people fight for independence, liberation, almost self-defense that should have its uh, rules, of course, and that's where we condemn and that's when we condone. Uh, but but definitely the bigger picture is of a people that were supposed to disappear in 1948, totally disappear, and find a way to still be there and fight and struggle against uh, what will become the strongest army in the Middle East, supported unconditionally by the strongest superpower in the world, and enjoys an international coalition uh, 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 in the West. Uh, while those who are colonized do not have really full support from the Arab world, from the Muslim world or for anyone else. So the imbalance of power is such that, you know, the weak use sometimes weapons which the strong doesn't have to use because it has much more lethal weapons It's in, in its uh, possession. You, you mentioned, I don't want to put words in your mouth, so if I, if I didn't hear this correctly, you'll, you'll let me know. It seemed like yeah. this movement starts to lose some steam or at least activity in 1982. Yep. And then in 1987, we get the first intifada. What what, what does intifada mean? Yeah. Uh, first of all, let me say one sentence on 1982, and I, I, I'll go to the intifada. It's connected in many ways. In, in, after the Israeli invasion uh, to Lebanon, one of the results of that invasion was the removal of the PLO, uh, uh, at least the headquarters of the PLO, from Beirut to Tunis. And that weakens very much uh, uh, the, the national struggle and the liberation struggle. It also causes uh, a, a dissent and rift and, 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 and internal uh, struggles that weaken the movement even uh, uh, further. And uh, this meant that the, the occupied Palestinians in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, it, it takes them five years, as we know, begin to understand that the PLO doesn't have the same power it may have had before 1982 to be an important part of the struggle against the, the what is now not only a struggle for liberation, but a struggle that wants to first and foremost to end a very ruthless and harsh military occupation. And then they decided not to consult the PLO and without the knowledge of the PLO, in 1987, they uh, decide to go on an uprising. They use the term intifada, which, the, by the way, they also, some of them used for the 1936-1939 uh, revolt. Uh, intifada uh, literally means shaking off. So, so it's, it's a kind of 
it's shaking off. First of all, it's shaking off the occupation. So it's not it's not the the, the struggle for liberation yet. It's a precondition for the liberation is shaking off your occupy, removing the occupation from your life. Uh, if you want, removing the boot over your face before you decide to rise up and, and be a human being again. And, and that's the meaning of this. Uh, and, and that breaks out uh, in, in an impressive way in 1987 through a united uh, command uh, with a strong basis among workers students, refugee camps, women organizations play a very important role in it. Uh, it's based on self-sufficiency when the Israeli collective punishment response tries to starve some of the populations. Uh, it shows a great uh, uh, level of solidarity uh, and, and compassion for those who are, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, inflicted uh, by, by this uh, Israeli uh, reaction, uh, and uh, in many, many ways, it's a non-violent uh, 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 resistance, uh, which catches the eyes of many people in the world because it's the first uh, re Palestinian resistance that is fully televised. And, uh, and the images that catch the eyes are the images of the young children, you know, uh, throwing stones at Israeli uh, tanks, which is really a, a very common feature of what happened. Uh, and and um, uh, this, uh, again, uh, it's another, it's it's a beginning of a new chapter in the history uh, of the Palestinian liberation movement. It's a success. And the sense is that, okay, we, we forced the world, mainly, especially the Americans, because they are the most important peace brokers, we force them to reopen the diplomatic discussion, a serious diplomatic discussion about the future of Palestine. So that we don't have to fight anymore. You know, we fought and, and we attracted the attention of those who are important. And then comes a series, you could call it kind of a series of, of diplomatic uh, uh, illusions uh, and, and fabrications, I would say, uh, and betrayals in many ways of uh, the promises made to the Palestinians that said, okay, we, we, we fully uh, sympathize with you and you will be rewarded with the end of occupation. The first attempt is the Madrid conference in 1991 uh, and that does not lead to anywhere. And then comes the Oslo agreement in 1993. These two events, the Madrid conference and the Oslo accord was supposed to be the diplomatic reward for the uprising, the first uprising. But uh, uh, Israel has no intention whatsoever to end the occupation. The only thing that the uprising does to the Israeli mindset and strategic thinking is to look for alternative ways to replace the direct occupation with indirect uh, occupation. And that's when to the world comes the Palestinian Authority and all the particular arrangements which are associated with uh, the Oslo Agreement. That, that, we're down to our final two minutes, but that, that's why the Oslo Agreement didn't work. It didn't, yeah, because it was an Israeli ploy to replace the direct occupation with the cheaper, first of all, economically cheaper option uh, of having a, a collaborative Palestinian agency to run the affairs for them and to make sure that they mesmerize the whole process and the Palestinians would uprise again in 2000, uh, and the rest needs more time. The rest but, uh, uh, with a lot more time. time. But we finished in 2000. <laughs> I'm always happy to come and look, talk about the liberation movement from 2000 until today uh, when we have the time. But, but it is interesting. I, I was in college when the Oslo Agreement Accords were, were, were reached and, mm -hmm. you know, I, I wasn't following it that closely, just marginally. And, you know, my thought then was like, OK, great. We, we finally have peace in the Middle East. This is great. But you write in your book, A New History of uh, uh, a History of Modern Palestine, that they put the, it, that the agreement didn't include the really tough issues that needed to be resolved. Yeah, definitely. All the outstanding issues, the refugees, the future of Jerusalem, the future of the settlements, are hardly mentioned in the Oslo Accord. And when in 2000, Arafat demands that these issues would be addressed, 
uh, and he doesn't get a positive response, President Clinton and the Israeli Prime Minister El Barak call him a warmonger. So he has nothing to lose. He goes and indeed he starts a war in 2000 uh, to try and again force the international community to take a more reasonable approach. But Israel reacts brutally and the rest, uh, as we know, is history, as they say. Okay. Well, one, one last question, one last minute, really, uh, which is unfair mm-hmm. to you. But uh, we, do you think this failure is what then leads to the rise and popularity towards groups? I, I know Hamas wouldn't come until later, yeah. 2000, yeah. In, in the 2000s. But, but do you think that leads to it? Yeah. We, we had somebody on recently who said the failure of pan-Arabism uh, would eventually lead to the rise of more religious politics? I think it's a bit more complex. First of all, the Hamas was founded in 1988, Maybe. namely that's already right. Right. Uh, yeah. during the first... I, I was thinking when they were elected, that's right. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's a bit more complex. It's uh, the rise of political Islam and Hamas is part of a general phenomenon of political Islam. It has to do with the uh, crisis in modernity in the Arab world. The modern secular ideological movements failed to cater for the needs of people, Did not, uh, were not able to deliver on the promises of liberation, economic justice, and, and so on. So people were trying something else and, and gave a chance to political Islamic movement, even if not all of them supported the whole theological vision that these movements had. And I think that's the reason for that popularity. Uh, But of course, the the moment uh, uh, peace efforts are exposed as Israeli ploys to to continue the occupation, movements that suggest to renew the armed struggle are becoming more popular. That, That makes a lot of sense to me that this is the case. Namely, the moment you will have a genuine attempt by the international community to allow for a genuine reconciliation, I think these movements will become more politicized, less militarized, and less popular as well. Ilan Pape, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mitch. Ilan Pape has been our guest, again, Professor of History and Director of the European Center for Palestine Studies at the University of Exeter in the United Kingdom, and author of many books, his latest, A History of Modern Palestine.